Our guest today is Marty Irby. He is the Executive Director of Animal Wellness Action in Washington, D.C. Marty, it's great talking to you again. Back in December, we started a conversation about a new library and facility that was constructed in Nashville, Tennessee, and there was a part of that construction that did not sit well with you. Could you talk about that to our listeners a bit here this morning? Yes, sir. Well, Roy, thank you so much for having me back on again. I really appreciate it and your attention to the issue of soaring in Tennessee walking horses. And what happened is the new Tennessee State Library and Archives that was built in Nashville has a huge, huge display of a big lick Tennessee walking horse with those giant stacked shoes and chains on the horse uh, displaying the soaring gait that can only be produced by soaring. And uh, the horse happens to be uh, trained, the horse in the engraving that's on the wall, trained by a guy named Tyler Bauckham in North Carolina. So uh, the actual engraving came from your state there. So uh, with as much work as you have done to bring attention to the issue of soaring, I guess I was innocent like a lot of other folks are innocent. Whenever I first saw a Tennessee walking horse with the you know, big shoes and the chains, I just thought that, that was part of the deal. But it's actually a pain-inflicting uh, mechanism uh, for the sole purpose of getting that big lick, so to speak. It is. And one of the things that's been you know, really disturbing is the Federal Horse Protection Act was signed into law in 1970 by President Nixon 52 years ago now. And my late friend, Senator Joe Tidings, authored that legislation and intended it for it to stamp out soaring over half a century ago, but there have been loopholes that have been left in the law that allowed the use of those chains and those big stack shoes in the show ring. That's probably the, the biggest problem. If I could eliminate one thing, that would be it. And that contributes to the soaring. The horses, once they're soared and their feet have pain from chemical uh, applications such as mustard oil, protein oil, diesel fuel, then they react and they step high as a result of those chains and the big shoes on their feet. And prior to 2020, there was never more than $705,000 per year in funding to enforce the Horse Protection Act. But we've been lobbying and really working hard in 2020. We got a million dollars in funding in 2021. We got $2,009,000 in funding. And now for 2022, what was just signed into law a few weeks ago, we have $3,040,000 for funding of enforcement of the Horse Protection Act. So we're really going to see enforcement ramped up. Part of that funding is supposed to be dedicated to science-based objective testing, like the radiograph, swabbing, testing for chemicals, blood tests, and things like that. And so we're really hoping that the U.S. Department of Agriculture cracks down on these guys and just stamps soaring out. They can do it with the tools that they have and the funding they have. They just haven't had that until this time, but we believe we can get rid of this terrible plight very soon. Well, I know you must feel pretty good because at one time you were labeled as one of the most effective lobbyists in Washington, D.C., but that begins to pale, or I would think that it would, over the fact that now you're finally going to have the resources in hand to where you can be much more proactive uh, for horses, not having to go into the showroom and, and hurt you know, with afflicted Absolutely. pain. Uh, that must be the big payoff. Absolutely, yes. This is very near and dear to me. I grew up in the walking horse industry and was the president of the Tennessee Walking Horse Breeders and Exhibitors Association about a decade ago. So it really means a lot to me. There's probably nothing more in the world that I've ever worked on that I care as much about as this. And I think we're going to see some big changes coming. Now, as I understand, uh, there's going to be much more enforcement, monitoring, testing, I guess, supervision, a watchful eye uh, at the show events, uh, you know, to tighten up before the shows go into the ring, even while they're still in the barn getting ready to go into the ring. Absolutely. Well, with the funding that we have obtained for 2022, we should see at least three times the enforcement that we saw two years ago. We should see more government inspectors going in, the use of more science-based objective equipment in testing, as I said earlier. And then we should see USDA and its Office of Inspector General going after some of these guys and really punishing them for when they've been caught soaring. That's been another part of the problem is that we haven't really had meaningful penalties that have been implemented and enforced 
because if a trainer soars a horse today and gets caught, he might end up with a two-week suspension or maybe if it's a really, really terrible case, a two- or three-month suspension. But then they take it in the off-season in November, December, January. So there's not much of a disincentive uh, to stop soaring these horses unless you have the federal government really cracking down against it. If I read this correctly, there's also going to be more uh, focus on the slaughter of horses, primarily for food purposes? Well, what we were able to do is maintain a de facto ban on horse slaughter in the U.S. So the um, operation of horse slaughter plants in this country hasn't really existed for about the past 12 or 14 years or so. And we have maintained that year over year ban by defunding the inspections at horse slaughter plants. And therefore, once they defunded, those plants could not operate. So we're saving the federal government about $5 million a year on that front. And all of the horses that were being slaughtered, the meat was being shipped to Europe and Asia, overseas on foreign dinner plates. And the companies that owned the horse slaughter plants at the U.S. were Belgium owned. So there was no real benefit to the U.S. economy or the folks out there in the horse world. It was simply just a pipeline to be able to, unfortunately, get rid of these horses. And we would much rather see people euthanize the horse humanely than haul them across the country, have them slaughtered, and go through such a terrible, painful process. Uh, talk a little bit about the issues that face horse racing. Of course, we know uh, one of the champion horses last year died, and it seems like there might be a correlation uh, between uh, doping of the horse and other horses that have died, especially uh, the race horse. Absolutely. Well, it's a very hot topic right now. We have less than five weeks until the Kentucky Derby, and the industry's most uh, notorious uh, or infamous trainer, Bob Baffert, who we see on television quite often, um, is amidst the controversy. His Kentucky Derby winner last year, Medina Spirit, was uh, tested positive for an illegal substance and subsequently went through a series of procedures and hearings and things like that. Ultimately, just a few weeks ago, uh, the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission stripped the horse of the 2021 Kentucky Derby title, awarded the title to the second place finisher. But unfortunately, uh, the poor little horse, Medina Spirit, he had actually already dropped dead on the horse track out in Santa Anita, California. And um, that was back in December, some sort of cardiac event. I think the results of the autopsies were inconclusive as to whether it was directly tied to drugging or not. But any horse that's been through that and has a cardiac event and dies on the racetrack uh, smells smells a little fishy, that type of incident to me. So what we're seeing now is Bob Baffert appealed the Kentucky Racing Commission's decision. They uh, upheld their decision on the appeal. He went further a few weeks ago, appealed to the Kentucky Circuit Court in Franklin County, Kentucky, and the judge upheld the suspension and said that Baffert would uh, have the opportunity to appeal to the uh, appellate court, but that he was going to uphold the suspension. So we should see sometime in the next two weeks uh, an appeal that goes through that process in Kentucky. In the meantime, Baffert has already lost four of his top contenders for the Kentucky Derby because those horses have to run in other events to qualify for the Kentucky Derby. And this suspension applies to Baffert across the board because of reciprocity among the states. So uh, he's, he's ultimately more than likely not going to be able to have any horse run in the Kentucky Derby. And that's what we hope happens because this guy has had violation after violation, dozens of them, and has really given a black eye to the sport of horse racing in the United States. Well, I guess you say, uh, Chickens come home to roost, and maybe that's what he's dealing with right now. How can our listeners uh, find out more about uh, your program? Well, please check us out on the Internet on our website, www.animalwellnessaction.org, or you can follow me on social media at Marty Irby, M-A-R-T-Y-I-R-B-Y. I'm on all the channels out there and appreciate this opportunity today. Well, uh, Marty Irby, uh, thank you so much for your time. It's always a pleasure talking to you, and hey, fight the good fight, man. Thank you, Roy. Have a great day.